Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Confirmation Lesson for Sunday, the 10th of May, uh, which is also Mother's Day. So a very happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, and the kids that are watching this video should be wishing your mom a happy Mother's Day. Uh, this is the last lesson in the unit on Jesus. This is actually the last lesson from the book for the year. Um, after this, we will do a couple of review lessons, and, and then on Pentecost, we're going to do a lesson on Pentecost, and then that's pretty much it for uh, the Sunday school year. Uh, but in this, we've spent the last six weeks looking at the, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, and in this final lesson, then, we ask the question, is it necessary to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to go to heaven? So, in other words, you know, what have we spent six weeks talking about? Is, is this the only way uh, to achieve salvation? I will tell you, so a couple of weeks ago during the Easter lesson, I said, this is probably the most important lesson of all of the two years of confirmation class. This one's probably the most important. And today, what I'll tell you about this lesson is, of all of them, it's probably the most controversial. Uh, th this is... This is the lesson that, because this is a, there's a lot of emotion surrounding this question of exclusivity. Uh, does Christianity really hold the only way to go to heaven and to spend eternity with God? That's a pretty bold claim, uh, and there's a lot of emotional feelings about that. And so um, there's also not a great cut and dried answer. I'll just warn you about that up front. So this is one of those lessons that, unlike most of them, where I give you and your teachers in seventh grade, sort of the way you learn in seventh grade is you kind of get given a list of things you're supposed to know, and then you take a test on it, right? And most of my classes are like that, too. But some of the classes are more like college lessons. And in college, you have a question. You have a number of approaches to answer that question, you have evidence that you look at, and at the end of the day, you're sort of left to draw your own conclusion, uh, which is how adults learn things. So uh, in, in many ways, this is going to be one of those lessons. Um, we've got a lot of scripture to read, a couple stories that we're going to tell. I'm going to break the question down for you. I'm going to give you both sides of it, and then I will tell you what the, the Lutheran teaching is on this. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is something that you have to kind of grapple with yourself, right? So, is Christianity the only way uh, to go to heaven? Let's, uh, to start thinking about this, let's go back to a story. And I say go back to because this is a story we've used in class before. Right? So this is the story of Nicodemus. So I want you to take your Bibles if you've got them. And if you don't have a Bible sitting in front of you, this is a great time to pause the video and go find one. Uh, and then when you do find it, turn to John chapter 3. So the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book in the New Testament, John chapter 3. Um, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to read a little bit of this story, and then we'll talk about what's going on here. Okay? So there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher that has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs. Remember we had that lesson on miracles a couple weeks ago, right? No one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God was not with him. And in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So this, you know, Jesus has a habit of, like, like, looking past the sort of surface issues of, of whatever somebody is bringing to him and going right to the heart of the matter, right? So Nicodemus, Nicodemus starts with a question about kind of, hey, what is the thing with these miracles, right? And Jesus just goes right past that and ignores it and goes straight to the issue that is at heart, which is Nicodemus's relationship with God. That's the issue that's at heart. So um, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Verse 5, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Uh, okay, so let's break down verse 5 there. I tell you the truth, no one... A pretty, you know, this is it's not being around the bush here. 
no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Now, remember last week we talked about liturgical churches and non-liturgical churches, so a little bit different understanding of that verse there. When, when we in the Lutheran Church say born of water and the Spirit, we are talking about the waters of baptism. And we believe that, that in the waters of baptism, you are born again. Other churches understand that to mean that you simply have to have a conversion experience and, you know, and uh, receive Christ and his message. And that is, this being born of water means that you are cleansed uh, from sin. Regardless of, of which interpretation you're looking at there, the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus says here, that no one gets to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you don't get to go to heaven or the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And then the end of the book of Luke, he's going to expound on that, right? So here, I want you to see, this is the very beginning of his ministry, right? This is chapter 3. Now then, I want you to move forward in Luke to chapter 14. Now this is a place we've visited several times over the past couple of weeks. Um, this is that, that speech at the Last Supper that Jesus is giving. Uh, and in Luke chapter 14, verse 6, you know, the disciples are basically asking him, you know, essentially what Nicodemus asked um, three years earlier in chapter 3. Uh, they, the disciples are saying, well, how is it you know, you're going to heaven? Can we go? With, how, do, how do we do that? Can we go with you? Uh, what's the deal? And Jesus answers in verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father uh, except through me. So here it seems that Jesus is making a claim of exclusivity. Jesus is saying that this, this is the one and only way to spend eternity with God or in what we understand to be heaven. So how, how do we how do we grapple with this? And how do we grapple with the question of well, what about everyone else? And, and what about God's grace in the gospel? And is that not for everyone? So let me talk to you a little bit about how what the two you know I do this in class a lot. I'll put out two extremes, and the answer is actually someplace in the middle, right? So let's let's talk about the extremes. On the one hand, is the extreme of exclusivity. That, that this, in fact, this is exactly, precisely what Jesus was saying, and that you must believe in Jesus Christ and, and have uh, what churches call a saving knowledge of Christ in order to spend eternity with God. And everyone that does not believe exactly that is condemned to spend eternity in the fires of hell. Um so th this side is kind of the, you get the golden ticket to go to heaven, but only a few people get the golden ticket. The other side is what's called universalism, uh, which is that Christ's atonement on the cross, Christ's dying on the cross and atoning for mankind's sin covers everyone. So all people are saved all throughout time, and everyone spends eternity with God, and everyone goes to heaven. So this is, you know, one of the things like, for instance, the, unit, the, the, uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church. You know, universalism means exactly what it sounds like, right? That salvation is universal. Um, okay. W what I would say to you is that, you know, probably neither of these views are completely correct. So as with a lot of things in this class, the, it, it falls to us to kind of try to understand uh, what is a, what it, the kind of the middle approach is. So in the church that I was raised in, churches, in the Baptist church, churches that, that tend to uh, emphasize more man's choice and man's actions and free will and the having a choice of believing in God's message or not, absolutely live over here on this side of the spectrum. And they teach that um, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and inviting him to come into your heart and asking him to forgive you of your sins is the only way that anyone, regardless of when or where they existed on the planet, can go to heaven. And everyone else is doomed to an eternity in hell. 
So, and, and that is absolutely what I was raised uh, believing. And what I will say about that is that if you boil your entire theology down to one true false question with one answer, it makes it very easy to be arrogant about what you believe because everything else is by definition wrong. And it's also kind of intellectually lazy. You know? But over here on the other hand, this isn't that, you know, what, what does this worldview say? It says that you know, since everything is covered already anyway, why, what's left for us to do here on earth? Isn't the kingdom of God here on earth as well? And don't we have work that we're supposed to do here on earth? Well, I, it, so um, why do we have to do any of that if, in fact, everyone on the planet is uh, has already achieved salvation? So, you know, that worldview probably not correct either. So the... Um, The next story that I want to look at, it, what we're really talking about here is grace, and how do we understand grace? How do we understand the work that Christ did on the cross to atone for sins? And, and to talk about grace, let's look at another parable. I want to look at uh, Luke chapter 16. Take a few minutes and get there. Luke chapter 16. So, so here is probably the most difficult to understand parable in the whole Bible. Right? It's the parable of the shrewd manager. And, and I will say up front that I've ripped most of this off from Pastor Sean, which is perfectly appropriate because I'm in confirmation class. I'm supposed to be saying the same stuff. Pastor Sean says from the pulpit, right? So, um, you know, with, with apologies to Sean, uh, let's read the story and let's talk about it. Let's think about this story in terms of the question that I have framed for you, the question of exclusivity and is it, a, is it an all or nothing kind of thing or is has Jesus's atoning work been done for everyone, right? Um, Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 1, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. And so he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each of his master's debtors in and asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. These are big amounts of stuff. 800 gallons of olive oil would have been like the yield of an entire olive farm. Um, the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He said, take your bill and make it 800. Well, now, why didn't it get to be 500 like the guy who just got half of his bill? We, we don't know, you know. Uh, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. You know, for for thousands of years, Christians have grappled with this parable. It, it's a very weird story, right? So basically, the master is commending the dishonest manager for being dishonest, and the dishonest manager is handing out essentially gifts, but he gives one guy half off of his bill, and he gives another guy only a couple hundred bucks off of his bill. And you say, well, you know. And the way to get at this, for, there's almost no good answer to what this parable means, right? A lot of Bible scholars have tried to say, well, you know, the, the master probably was charging too much because it was illegal to charge other Jews interest, but what they would do was overcharge. And so if the, if the manager had just taken off the illegal overcharge, then it would have been okay. And, you know, and a lot of that really doesn't work. Um, but if you remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I said, almost all parables are about God, the nature of God and the kingdom of God. So if you approach this parable that way and you say to yourself, well, if the owner is God 
and the shrewd manager who has control of God's assets is Jesus, the son. What's Jesus doing? He's giving out grace and it, and it, and it doesn't make any sense. And he's, he's given this guy grace and this guy grace and the formulas are not the same. And it, it, you know, the, the entire parable, and, and that's the point of the parable. The point is, is that, that grace is something we receive freely from God, God's riches at Christ's expense, grace. It's something we receive freely from God that we don't deserve, and it doesn't make any sense. And it's, you know, the, 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 uh, the Apostle Paul in another place in the Bible, the Apostle uh, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, you know, the, the Jews look for signs and the Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, uh, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentile. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense. So, so let's get back to the question then that, that we're grappling with. Um, the, the, the point that it, it, right about now I'd be showing you the video in class. And the takeaway point is that it's important for us as Christians to remember that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is for everyone. It's for everyone, including people that are not Christians, right? God's desire to have a covenant relationship with us. You know, most of the story of the Bible is about God's desire to have a, in fact, all of God, all of the story of the Bible is about God's desire to have a covenant relationship with us. He had a covenant with Noah. He had a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He had a covenant with Moses and the Israelite people. And Jesus comes to proclaim a new covenant. And that new covenant isn't just for Noah's family. It isn't just for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It isn't just for for Moses and the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. It is for everyone. Jesus' offer of a new covenant with God, a new relationship with God, is for all people across all time. We have, as Christians, have a tendency to think that it's, you know, sort of for us and that people who don't understand Jesus in the way that we do are kind of left out in the cold because they're not a part of this covenant. Uh, and that is not true. Uh, Jesus' offer of a new relationship with God, the gospel message, uh, is for all people. Um, so does that mean then that, uh, that you can be in heaven, go to heaven, spend eternity with God, and not have a belief in Jesus Christ? Um what what the film will tell you is that you know we're not here here's what we know we know that we have a covenantal relationship with Christ and with God in the waters of baptism and so as lutherans we be, firmly believe that we are a part of that kingdom of God and that we experience that through the waters of baptism now what we don't know is what that relationship, that seeking for God, that God seeking out a covenant with people, we don't know what that looks like for other people. And we shouldn't presume to know. A lot of churches will presume to know. They'll say, if you don't believe the thing that I believe, that therefore means that you do not have any sort of relationship with God. Uh, Lutherans in general tend to not use language like that. We don't believe that we are that we are qualified to make a statement about what someone's relationship with God is, and that the only person who is qualified to make a statement about that is God himself, who will ultimately be in charge of the um, who spends eternity with him. And the people that in their own way, shape, and form have sought to become part of this covenant relationship with God are going to spend eternity with God in that covenant relationship. Uh, we don't fully understand how that will work any more than we fully understand the parable of the shrewd manager, which doesn't, when you try to figure out why the manager is giving what to which tenant, doesn't make any sense. Um, and neither does grace. But 
we can take comfort in the waters of baptism and in understanding what our covenant relationship with God is. And I think that's the important uh, takeaway of this lesson. Uh, a lot of times when you're explaining your relationship with God and with Christ and your Christian beliefs and your Christianity with other people who don't necessarily believe and are asking questions, a lot of times you get confronted with the question, well, what about the people in, you know, the jungles of Africa who have never experienced Jesus's message? What about them? Are they going to rot in the fires of hell because they've never heard of Jesus? And my answer to that often is, I, I don't know, but you have heard about Jesus because I'm talking to him, you about him right now. So the question isn't what is their response, the question is what is your response? And, and I would, I guess I would say the same thing to you guys in confirmation class, that, that what you have been confronted with, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I guess my question to you would be, what is your reaction uh, to that gospel message? Okay, so um, let's see if I had, it seems like I had one other verse that we're supposed to look up today. Uh, yes, um, Romans 10.9 is the last piece of scripture that we will use for this lesson. So let's go, I've had you kind of bouncing around in the Gospels. So we've been in John, and we've been in Luke, and now we're going to Romans, which is two books later. So Acts, Romans, uh, chapter, chapter 10, verse 9. Chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? So that, in fact, is what we teach, right? And that is that is a part of the theology of our church. And, and that through, through that confession of faith and the waters of baptism, that we're going to spend uh, eternity with God. But what that verse doesn't say is the fact that that God desires this covenantal relationship with everyone, not, not just Christians. This is not an exclusive sort of thing. The, the Lutheran Church doesn't teach that we're sort of an exclusive club that you have to get into by invitation only, uh, because you know Jesus has extended that invitation to everyone. Okay, I hope that lesson uh, makes some sense. Uh, it, it is one of the more difficult ones in this workbook uh, to teach. Uh, but again, I, I want to just, I want to close by um, 